So today's Bible study topic is prosecuting money, stealing evil altars in your bloodline. Prosecuting money, stealing evil altars in your bloodline. Praise God. That's what we're going to be believing God to help us do in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, our Moments of Inspired Teaching, our next Bible study is going to be September 5th, same time, 8 a.m. PST, uh, 10 a.m. CST, and 11 a.m. EST. Our topic is going to be the voices in the courts of heaven, and I may have a huge surprise for you. Um, I'm believing God to have my friend Robert Henderson uh, be, be a special guest on this particular Bible study. We're going to have a, you know, we're trusting God for that, but it's going to be an amazing topic anyway. Praise God. Now, so today I want, I want to make a, a couple of powerful statements as we begin to tackle the subject of prosecuting uh, money stealing evil authors in your bloodline. The, in the, the first commandment, uh, in the, among the Ten Commandments, the first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Very interesting that among the Ten Commandments, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The implication is very clear. It is this, that the number one problem we are going to have in our life as humans is the desire to go after other gods. Otherwise, God will not make that commandment the first commandment. The fact that it's the first commandment means that idolatry, you know, or dealing with other gods is going to be more common than any other thing. So the number one problem in our world is idolatry. So idols are more common than you think. They are more common than you think. This is very, very interesting, you know. Because many of us, when we think of idolatry, we try to run away from it because the, what the, one, one, of the, the, one of the powerful tools of the devil, he has managed to make us the church of Jesus Christ, talking about idolatry, in, uh, he has put a stigma around it that we are afraid to talk about the, ve the very subject that I believe can bring great deliverance in our life and ministries and our destinies if we ever addressed it. But how the enemy, is, how the enemy is, is hiding in our lives, in our bloodlines, in our souls, and he keeps, he keeps perpetuating evil and uh, crisis, stealing money from us, breakthrough from us, is because he has made it difficult for us to discuss the, one num the number one problem of mankind, which is idolatry, which is connected to this whole subject of altars as we are going to get into. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. I was very shocked recently when I was looking at this because I like to listen to, I like to, listen to, faith, to faith, the book of 1 John. I go to sleep to it sometimes. I listen to it on audio. And then one day I was listening on audio and the last verse is, this is how John, the beloved, closes out the book of 1 John. He closes it out by saying, little children, believers, dear ones, guard yourselves from idols, false teachings, moral compromises, and anything that would take God's place in your heart. I had never noticed that before, that he ends, he ends up closing the whole book by simply saying, little children, free, uh, be careful of idols. Stay away from idols. Why would he say that unless he knows that that's the number one problem? That's the number one problem that all believers are going to have to deal with from time to time. You know, until the Lord began to give me this revelation with my dear friend Katie Souza on idols and evil authors, man, I, I, we were both shocked to discover how many idols in our own life it, 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 that God was showing us now that we had to repent of and ask God to begin to cleanse us. And God said, he said to us, I'm going to stigmat, destigmatize the, this subject so that my people can deal with what's already there in their soul. It does not make, you, it does not make God love you any less if you have to acknowledge, hey, Lord, I've, I discover I've got some idols in my life. You know, it does not make you Jesus love you any less. He already knew they were there. He wants you to discover them so that he be, it, as you discover them, he can cleanse you from them. And the more he cleanses you, the more intimate you become with Jesus, the more close you become with Jesus, because idols is what causes us not to be close with the Lord. You know, 
And so I want to really get into this today, you know, but particularly today I want to focus on evil authors, and I'm going to define that in a little bit. But just want to paint a picture of the problem we face. You know, I was when I was when when I was looking at the Ten Commandments, the Lord said to me, Francis, notice there are Ten Commandments, but the first one is, "Thou shalt have no other gods before me." But, but just right after those, you'll find commandments like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I said, and the Lord said to me, Francis, do you realize that if my people just kept, if mankind just obeyed the first commandment, there would be no need for the other, the other nine commandments. All the other nine commandments are necessary if we keep the first one. In other words, God was telling me, Francis, you know why people kill? You know why people steal? It's because the idols in their hearts are driving them to steal because they love money or they believe they, that belongs to me. Their idols in their heart is what causes them not to be, to, be, to be what? Satisfied with the wife of the covenant. You want something else, a mistress on the side. Those are idols that drive us to want to, can that drive a married woman, married man to want to look outside for what the marriage covenant is supposed to provide legally. It's idols. God said to me, you would know you, the other nine commandments are supporting beams to one issue. Thou shall have no other gods before me. So guess what? There's nothing, there's no commandment among the 10 we break almost on a daily basis than number one. But thank God for the grace of God. He's going to deliver us because if you are going to understand how to prosecute money, stealing evil authors in your bloodline, You've got to have a background to how they steal your money. There are two spiritual evil power centers that affect our lives on a daily basis, more than anything. And I want you to understand them. These two power centers are idols and altars. Idols and altars. And the Bible has a lot to say about idols, and the Bible has a lot to say about altars has a lot to say about them. But these are two power centers. They are two spiritual evil power centers that affect our lives on a daily basis. And in the case of our study today, literally affect us and rob us of our finances. Some of you are listening to me who would be millionaires by now, except for the idols and evil altars in your bloodline that have robbed your blind, that you're having to start over again. Your business that was supposed to prosper, something happened to here, and you lost and you had to start again. And you think it's just the devil attacking you, but what is he attacking you from? What is he using to attack you? Can I submit to you most of the attacks we are dealing we are, that, are, that are hitting us in our lives, I'm telling you, I can put, my, I can put a thousand dollars on the table, that the majority of them are coming from these two power centers, idols and evil altars. And I'm going to define both of them. Praise God. So let's define these two power centers. An idol is a demon god, because that's what an idol is. Now you see idols in the Bible, they were always characters of what men would make. They would make some people make stone. Like, you know, if you go into most uh, Thai massage places or restaurants, you, you are going to come through the restaurant, even though you like the food, just understand that they are letting you know as you're coming through the restaurant that they believe their business stands on those. I mean, they, they've, got, they've got Buddhas, they've got dragons. I mean, to them, that's just not art. It's the representation of the gods that they worship in, the, you know, in, in most of Asia. But, but, but we know that stones are, are, are useless in and of themselves. A stone, a wooden carving is useless if it's not connected to a spirit. So an idol is a demon god which hides behind an object or our unsanctified soulish desires to cause us to place something in our life above God. So this is what an idol is. It's a demon god just hiding behind an object for some people. So for the people, you know, who are into Buddhism, he hides behind the, that fat Buddha. You know, but what's behind that is a demonic spirit that if they don't get delivered, they don't come to Christ. That idol that was, by, that demon that was hiding behind their idol will drag their soul to where they belong in hell. 
because every idol always takes you home. If you die in the name of that idol, then you, the idol has a legal right to take your soul to where it came from. And since all idols or demon gods come from the bottom, bottomless pit, so guess what happens to people when they die who worship the idols? The idols, oh, they finally meet their spirits. Now, some people who are into deep witchcraft, they actually know. They actually know what they are worshiping because the, the demonic spirits have already manifested themselves to them. But the majority of people on the earth you know, who are just on the surface, they have no clue. They are deceived. They just think, well, it's a, just an object, whatever. I'm just worshiping something. But hey, when they die, they find out there was a spirit, a malicious spirit behind the idol, and it drags them to hell. You know, but sometimes the idols don't need an object. They just hide behind our unsanctified, unsanctified soulish desires to cause as to place something in our life above God. And this is the most common way idols operate in the life of born again believers who love Jesus. Because if you love Jesus, nobody's gonna sell you some Buddha. Nobody's gonna sell you an object to worship. You're gonna say the devil is a lie, I worship Jesus. And, and, and rightfully so, and you mean it. And yet, and yet, demon, and yet the spread world is so subtle. What about these unsanctified soulish desires? You know, sometimes we have, you know, let's say for instance, you know, having a house is not, there's nothing wrong with having a house. But when you how but when you idolize your house, you idolize your car, you idolize your wife, you idolize your husband, guess what? That's an unsanctified soulish desire. And a spirit can hide behind it. And then, you know, and use somebody that you are genuinely caught to love, but now become an idol. And the devil stands behind it. That's, those are the most common idol, idols in the lives of believers. The one that hide behind our sanctified soulish desires. And that's the key to understanding how they steal our money. And we're going to get to that, to that situation. The reason I'm teaching this is because there is a wealth transfer that's going on right now. You better believe it. There is a supernatural wealth transfer happening right now in the middle of the COVID-D. Something supernatural is happening. There is a wealth transfer. And God wants to make sure that what he gives us in this season, we get to keep. And don't have to lose it again in a couple of years to these idols and evil authors that have not been prosecuted in our soul or our bloodline. Now, where does an altar? Now, the other power center is, is, is an altar. An altar is a platform of exchange. It's a system of authorization. A place where covenants are made and sustained. It's a landing strip where humanity encounters divinity. That is what an altar is. And you are going to find altars are all over the Bible. They are evil altars and they are righteous altars. Abraham built an altar to the Lord. Noah built an altar to God. Isaac built an altar to the Lord. Jacob, I mean, you can go on and on. Nobody God ever used could be used by God without building this power center called an altar where God was worshipped, where God, where they came to meet with God, to make covenant with God, exchange with God. You know, these altars become systems of, of them authorizing God to legally work in their life now, if you are Abraham. But the devil is a copycat. So he copied the system of altars that began with the Lord. Now we see evil altars. And many of us, we have evil authors in our bloodline that have, be, that have been, uh, never been prosecuted. And this Bible study is about taking you to the court of heaven. And we are going to prosecute these evil authors in your bloodline, especially the ones that are designed to steal your money, because your finances are important to the advancement of the kingdom. And God wants to redeem your finances today. So we see this thing in the whole Bible. The truth of the matter is, when it comes to the soul, it's the soul that lasts for idols. You know, how your spirit is born again. When you're born again, your spirit has no desire for idolatry. Because the Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. So if you're one spirit with the Lord, trust me, the last thing your, soul, your spirit wants is idolatry. So your spirit does not participate in idolatry. But boy, God help our soul. It's been traumatized. It was rejected. We were abused. You know, somebody lied on us. Somebody cheated on us. All of those blows are going into the soul. And if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to quickly heal us from the trauma, those traumas can become landing places where the enemy puts an altar and says, you know what? 
you know what, don't worry. You know, I, I, I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna make this be the one that supplies your comfort. You know, whenever you feel the pain or you feel so sad because Johnny left you or Susan left you, guess what? Just go into the fridge and just eat, eat up, eat up, eat up because the food makes you feel better. That becomes an idol because God, food now becomes an idol. And then guess what? Idols and altars are inseparable. Every idol demands an altar. There is, no, there is no idol or demon God that will ever operate in your life without an, an altar. Because an altar must be in place for any spirit to operate. That's the law of God. Even God himself cannot operate in your life without an altar in your life. You have to build him an altar. I mean, your altar could be your heart, but there has to be an altar for God to move or for spirits to connect with humanity. That's the law of altars. That's the law of dominion. It demands it. When God said, let them have dominion, let them have dominion, God took himself and every spirit out of having legal authority on the earth. That means even God requires permission from a human for him to move. That's why God has to look for men or women who are willing to work with him. If he will, since he's God and he's, he's so sovereign, why not just bust a move without even involving you? Because he can't. The reason he can't is because of the law of dominion, Genesis 126, let them, male and female, have dominion. He didn't say let them and us. He completely excluded himself and every spirit. So God requires a human being to connect with him. And then you become an altar of God. And then through your life, God begins to pump out power and miracles to a generation. That's why God raises the Benny Hins, raises the T.D. Jacks, the Mouse Monroes, because he needs a man to work with. But the devil does the same thing and he replicates that. And unfortunately, some of our ancestors we are, we did not have the knowledge of God and in their foolishness, they made contracts with idols and demon gods who promised them wealth, prosperity, longevity, or, or protection. And they thought it was just a game. It was not a game. The devil said, thank you for the authorization. Now have the legal right to continue to travel in your bloodline long after you are gone because now I have an altar, I have an airport, I have a landing strip, I have, an, a, I have a system of authorization. So until those altars are prosecuted by a person carrying the same DNA, they remain in the bloodline. And today, God is going to help us do that. Praise God. Now, how, I'm going to show you how idols and evil authors steal your money. Here is, is the book of Acts. It's an interesting, interesting uh, passage in the book of Acts. Check this out. Now, about that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. Jesus, Jesus now a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of the goddess Artemis, Diana was bringing no small profit to the craftsmen. These craftsmen, are, he caught together along with the workmen of similar trade and said, men, you are well aware that we make a good living from this business. You see that, that not only at Ephesus, but almost all over the province of Asia, this Paul has persuaded people to believe his teaching and has misled a large number of people claiming that God, here it comes, that gods made by human hands are not really gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours will be discredited, but also that the magnificent temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And that she whom all Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned and lose their glorious magnificence. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and they began, they began shouting. They began shouting. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Then the city was filled with confusion. And people rushed together as a group into amphitheater, dragging along with them Gaius and Astikras, Macedonians who were post-traveling companions. So this passage is about idols and evil authors. Remember, whatever there's idols, there's evil authors. You can guarantee it. But we find that Paul's teaching, the apostolic ministry of Paul, was affecting the idolatrous structure of Ephesus. 
You see, true apostolic ministry is not just planning churches. It's addressing the popular cultural idols that are keeping people from giving their lives to God who deserves their worship. Okay? And so there was a guy by the name of Demetrius who made a lot of money from selling idols. Do you know in, a, in every culture, there's always people, Satan raises and anoints them to make money by selling other people idols. There are people who are, who, I mean, they are, see, idolatry is being monetized by the devil because the devil knows what you monetize is difficult to destroy. Why do you think Planned Parenthood is very difficult to destroy? It's been so monetized and then it uses its money to support politicians who believe in it. You think that's why that idol is difficult to bring down because it's been monetized. There are people who are profiting from killing babies. If it was not profitable, come on, they know what they're doing is wrong, but, but, but my God, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. That idol called Planned Parenthood, you know, the abortion of babies, my God, you know, because we know the abortion of babies was connected to the idol Molech. Molech was an idol in the Bible that always demanded the sacrifice, that parents sacrifice their children to Molech. That's how you worship Molech. You know, God would warn Israel against worshiping Molech because the Molech was the God that demanded, if you worship me, I need you to show your allegiance by sacrificing your babies to me. That's where the abortion spread comes from. So Malik is the God behind parent, plant, plant parenthood. When those people who, who, who oversee that organization, that organization die, they'll be screaming on their way to hell because for the first time they're going to meet Malik. But on this side of earth, oh, it's, it's about the money. It's about the political power. You know, but the point is, this man, Demetrius, rises to protect idolatry in Ephesus because he says, listen, if we don't do something, we are going to lose all our resources to Paul's. Nobody's going to buy idols. Nobody's going to buy yeah, idols because Paul is telling them they're not gods at all. So check this out. But when they realized that he was a Jew, a single outcry went, went from the crowd. Let me just go back here. There's something I want to, I want to say. How do idols and evil altar steal your money? The answer is by rioting. If, I, if you actually see what's happening there, they are rioting. In the New King James, actually it says they were riot, they went, there was a riot. You know, it's very interesting that we're having a lot of riots in America today. You know what the Lord told me? Fans, every time you see a riot, you see there's a difference between a protest, a peaceful protest and a riot. God, God told me every time you see a riot, it's idols. It's idols in the souls of men that are acting out. And notice whenever idols act out, money, I mean, you either are losing money, you know, but watch this, what happens is how do idols riot in our life to cause us to lose money? Let's just say, let's just say you have an idol of rejection in your soul, okay? Something, you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, you, you are rejected. And you know, you know, we are designed to be accepted. I get it. But somehow you got rejected and you, you know, now so you have a trauma of rejection. That's this is a sore wound. There's nothing wrong with it. You have a sore wound, but you need to get healed. But if you don't get healed, then the enemy will come around that soul wound, okay? And tell you, hey, listen, every time you, get, you, you feel rejected, have more ice cream, or you, 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 or you attack the fridge. So here's what the devil is saying. You know, because remember, when we are, when we are sick in the soul, where, where do we go? Because whosoever heals you is your God. Whosoever heals you is your God. That's why there's a story in the Bible where one of the kings of Israel, when he was sick, went to ask a medium, a witch, a witch doctor, whether he was going to get healed. And on his way, when he sent his messengers on the way, when these messengers were on the way to go and seek a, a sorcerer to find out if the king was going to live or die, God sent the prophet Elijah and he was mad. God said, is it, is it because I'm not God? that the king of Israel is asking a witch doctor whether he's going to get healed or not. And God says to, to Elijah, go and tell him, because he went to the sorcerer to look for healing, tell him this day you shall surely die. It's in the Bible in the Old Testament. Because whatever heals you is your God. Whatever you go to fix you is your God. So all of a sudden, you've got this brokenness in your soul. And uh, the way you medicate it, every time you feel rejected or you feel alone, depressed, is you attack the fridge. So guess what the devil, the devil has done? He has made food an idol. Now food becomes the idol. Okay? And the fridge becomes the altar where you meet with that idol to service it, to attend to it. 
But every time you, it makes you eat, 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 you feel better about yourself. You feel comforted in your depression or in your rejection. But guess what? Food runs out. The idol says, you're feeling rejected today, don't you? Well, run, 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 to, run to Walmart. Go and buy as much food as you can. Because you, you know you're going to need that food to make yourself feel better. Or maybe you're going to need the movie. You're going to need the movie. So you, I mean, you're paying for movie after movie because, you know, you know just, just watching the movie makes me feel better. Well, you're supposed to be getting that from God's presence. See, this is how idols and evil ought to steal your money. They make you spend money on them. They make us, they riot in our soul until we have to silence. The only way we have to, they'll stop rioting is we feed them with what they want us to feed them with. So if your idol is pornography, Guess what happens? The, the, the enemy who keep having you charge your credit card. And I've seen people, I've met, I've met men that are, who, who are so addicted, Christian men that have to go through deliverance. They are so addicted to pornography that they spend, they, they spend hundreds of dollars, even more on the, on, it, on the internet, just charging their credit card to see that junk. But you call it junk, but to them, it satisfies something in them that's broken. But all the while, guess what's happening? You are bleeding money to the altars. And, and you know, this is very interesting that, this, that, that the, the more money you make, your idols just demand more toys to make you feel better. But here is the good news. Idols and evil altars can be silenced and prosecuted in court. And this is what, that, this is what, this is teaching, this is what I'm here today. Idols and evil authors can be silenced and prosecuted in court. Look at this, Acts 19 from verse 35. But when they realized that he, he was a Jew, a single outcry went up from the crowd as they shouted for about two hours. Great is a temist of the Ephesians. After the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of, of Ephesus, what person is there who does not know that the city of, of the Ephesians is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of that sacred stone image of her, which fell from the sky. So since they, these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and stay calm and not to do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither temple robbers nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are in session. Check this out. The courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another there. But if you want anything beyond this, it will be settled in the lawful assembly. For we are running the risk of being accused of rioting in, in, in regarding today's events. And since there's no reason for it, we will be unable to give account and justify this disorderly gathering. Very interesting that for two hours, nobody would stop the Ephesians from screaming because the idols in them were mad with Paul's message. They were rioting. They were screaming for two hours. And we can't even get Christians to praise the Lord for two minutes. These are screaming for two hours. That's a long time to scream nonstop. They didn't, they didn't even breathe. These idols were right, driving them crazy, kind of what we're seeing in Portland every night. But check how, but here's the key. How did the, how did the rioting, noisy crowd get silenced? This is the revelation. An officer of the court came in the middle of the riot and told them, hello, this is a disorderly conduct. Listen, if you have got, if Demetrius and his craftsmen have something against Paul and his guys, there's a, there's a way to do it. We're going to take everything to court. And the Bible says, and everybody was silenced and went and, and got dispersed, and they began to go home. And the Spirit of God said to me, Francis, that the revelation behind the scripture is this. 
the idols and the evil altars in your bloodline will never stop demanding that you pay them, demanding, driving you to do things, driving you to buy cars you don't need, driving you to buy clothes you don't need. You buy it, impulse buying, and then you get home. You never wear the dress except for once. And for some of you, what you bought last year is still in your wardrobe. You spent $500 because you thought, I need that, I need that dress. I need, I, need, I need those clothes. But you've never worn them because your closet is an altar to this, to, this, to this idol of impulse buying, whatever it is. But at the time, I just had to have the dress. Money is gone. Money that could have been given as a seed to the kingdom, money that could have helped orphans, you know, not Jesus, better money that could have bought some Bibles to go to China. You know, you spent on those clothes that you have never worn, maybe once and maybe never. God said to me, the only way, Francis, you silence the idols and the evil altars and tell them, stop rioting in my soul, stop rioting in my bloodline. I am not going to save you. I'm going to put my money on you, is you take them to court. That's what this Bible study is about today, is I'm going to help you take those idols that are in your bloodline, that are, that are rioting, you know, causing you to lose your money, you know, spend, uh, spend God's money on foolish stuff, you know, or lose money through stupid accidents, you know, that you think is just an accident, but it's these idols in your bloodline rising to steal your money when you need it the most. I'm going to show you how you take them to court and prosecute them. It's abundantly clear from the previous passage that idolatry is a monetized demonic practice. Idolatry is monetized at both ends of the line. Firstly, the modern day Demetrius who create products that are idolized by others derive great wealth from the selling of these idols. You know, and so there will be always be more than dead Demetrius who fight. They have lobbying group. They have lobbies in Washington, D.C. to fight for their idols, for their products. Because why? Even though their products are destroying people, they just want to keep the selling them because that's how they are able to drive their Bentleys. But secondly, look, look, look at the drug dealers. They are the Demetrius of today. They know their drugs are killing people, destroying people's minds. But the cartel will kill you if you stop them from selling their idols, their products. Why? Because there are people that worship the, the idols behind crack cocaine that need to be fed by that by, that, by, by the food that demon eats, which is drugs. Secondly, consumers of idols spend vast amounts of money every year on their idols in order to bring comfort to their idolatrous soul. You know why people go on crack cocaine? It's, because, it's, it's not because they love the highs. It's because the cocaine highs for a moment, for that temporary moment of the high, kill something they are running away in the soul. Something got broken in the soul. And the cocaine became a way to medicate, forget the troubles, forget the trauma, forget whatever it is. And God, meanwhile, is saying, I could heal you all of it. You don't have to go to crack cocaine or methamphetamine, whatever that is. And I don't even know what these drugs are. And there are preachers who have been caught taking drugs. Preachers of the gospel. There's a very famous old pastor from Orlando who died of a drug overdose in an hotel in New York after doing a three-day revival for the mega church. And they find him dead in his hotel because when he went back from the hotel, after a revival, God used him. He went back to his hotel. He went on the streets of New York and he got more. He got, he got drugs. And because he was trying to hide them, he, took the, he had to inject himself, but he, he took too much. They, they, the police, the autopsy said the body was killed by the drugs. He had a 5,000 member church in Orlando. He was on TBN all the time. I don't want to mention his name because God rest his soul. But this is what idols will do. They'll make you spend money on them, take your money that God is giving you and you spend it on them until the day they kill you. So, in order to bring down these evil altars and idols that are, that are connected to them, that are causing us to lose our money, you know, spend God's money on them, we must identify the strong man. We must identify the strong man. Okay? There's, there, Jesus told us, he said, unless you identify the strong man and plunder, plunder him, you cannot take his goods. So let's quickly identify the strong man before I take everybody that's on the call today into the court of heaven because I'm going to lead everybody today live 
into the court of heaven and we are going to destroy this evil authors and idols in your bloodline that are stealing your finances because God is about to bless you like never before in Jesus' name. Well, they, when, I, when, when we're doing a study of this, the strong man over idols in the Bible is called the Assyrian king. Just like Jezebel represents a controlling spirit and different spirits in the Bible. Well, the Assyrian king in the Bible is a strong man. The Bible identifies the Assyrian king as the strong man over the kingdom of idols. That means if he's the strong man over the kingdom of idols, then he's also the strong man over evil authors. Because no idol ever has exists without an, without an, without an, without an altar. So the Bible is going to show us that the Assyrian king robs people and nations. Look at the, what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 10. For Assyria says, are not my princes or kings? Is not Kauno conquered like Chemish on the Euphrates? Is not Hamath subdued like Afad, her neighbor? Is not Samaria in Israel like Damascus in Aram? As my hand has reached to the kingdom of the idols, is boasting. He says, my hand is so powerful, I have a reach to all the kingdom of idols. Anywhere you find an idol or evil altars, that spirit is serving me. That idol is under my control. I'm the strong man. As my hand has reached to the kingdom of the idols, whose carved images were greater and more feared than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images, just as I've done to Samaria and her idols, declares Assyria? So when the Lord, so when the Lord has completed all his work of judgment on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit, the thoughts, the declarations, and the actions of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the hardness of his pride. For the Assyrian king has said, I have done this by the power of my own hand and by my wisdom. For I have understanding and skill. I have removed the boundaries of the people and have plundered their treasures. I said, God, what do you mean by this? I have removed, check this out. I have removed the boundaries of the people. God said to me, Francis, idolatry, when there's idols and evil orders in your bloodline, they, you, you, lose, uh, you lose the ability to control yourself when these idols come calling. So in your bloodline, if there's an idol of, um, what is this? Spending more, spending more money than you have. Even though you promise yourself, I'm not going to do it. As soon as the money comes in your hand, trust me, you're going to spend more money than you have. Why? Because in that area, there is an altar, an evil altar with an idol function in it that was given legal authority by your forefathers that every time you have money, guess what? There is no boundaries. Some people can't control themselves. That's what it means. He says, I've destroyed their boundaries, and therefore, because they have no boundaries, I'm able to do what? Plunder their treasures. Money God gave you to build a house, and you end up buying a car you don't need. Or money God gave you to build a TV studio for the Lord, you end up going on a vacation. And it's okay, you know what? I, 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 should, have, I, sh I should have really bought some cameras to do my, my, my Bible study with, but you know what? Ah, some, I just saw this a flyer about this 50% off at the risk Carlton in, in Hawaii. My family and I, we've been wanting to go to Hawaii. And bam, you spend the money in Hawaii? But what the money was meant for was for you to build God a TV studio so you can have a nice Bible study for the Lord that we and preach the gospel in a... And now but it's gone because you have no boundaries. Your treasures have been planted. It says, like a bull, I brought down those who sat on thrones. My hand has found the wealth of the people like a nest. Have you ever heard of the expression, my nest egg? My nest egg. Well, the king of Assyria is the demon that comes after your nest egg. Your 401ks. You just build a business and all of a sudden something happens and you lost all the money. As one gathers eggs that are abandoned, so I've gathered all the earth. But, but thankfully, saints, today we are going to prosecute this demon in the court of heaven. This strong man, we are taking him to court because it's time for God, for him to let, take his dirty hands off of your money that God wants to give to you and your bloodline in Jesus' name. Now, we have the story quickly of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, you know, has a failed attempt to overthrow the Assyrian king. The reason I bring up Hezekiah because I want you to know why many of you I prayed for financial breakthrough, tried to bind the devil, and nothing is happening. Because if you don't address the, the evil order in your bloodline, if you try to come against it just in prayer, you're going to lose. 
zeal is not good enough when they're dealing with evil altars in your bloodline. They have to be taken to court. Zeal is not good enough. Praying is not good enough. Many of you have been praying and fasting. And sometimes the more you fast, the more you seem to have more trouble. Because prayer without taking the, these idols or, or, blood, or evil altars to court is simply poking the eye of the bear. Try to book the eye of the bear. If you're, unless you have, you, you, you've got a strategy to kill it, you're just going to create more chaos. Look at this. In the third year, in 2 Kings 18, in the third year of Oshia, of Shia, son of Elah, king of Israel, Ezekiah, son of Ahaz, look at this, remember that word, Ezekiah, son of Ahaz. So his father was Ahaz. Remember that name. Ezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Ezekiah did right in the sight of the Lord. He loved the Lord, just like many of you on the, on the call. According to all that David, his forefather, had done, he removed the high places, broke the images, cut down the ashram, and broke in pieces the bronze sapron that Moses had made. Uh, for until then, the Israelites had burned incense to it, but he called it ne Neheshutan to a bronze trifle. And the Lord was with Ezekiah. He prospered wherever he went, and re he rebelled against the king of Assyria and refused to save him. So this is just a prophetic picture of you and I. You find out, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bow down to the idols, the evil altars of my father's house. I'm not going to become like my uncle. I won't become like my daddy. I mean, great. You love the Lord. You are, God begins to prosper you. And then all of a sudden, it's like something hits you. You're like, what happened? I love the Lord. I mean, I mean, my heart is for Jesus, whatever. Where did these attacks, where, how did I end up losing everything with, with all the love I have for the Lord? I tithe, I give my offering up. What's going on? Here's what happened to Hezekiah. He wanted to resist. He knew that the, the king of Assyria was the, he did, he did not want to serve the evil altars or idols that were in his bloodline. But check this out. But he never took them to court. Watch this. So, <laughs> so, King Hezekiah ends up giving money to the Assyrian king anyway. <laughs> Why? Because King Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, was a hardcore idol worshiper. The Bible says his father made molten images of the god Baal. He even burnt his sons on fire to this evil god. That was Ahaz, his father, the father of Hezekiah, had actually built altars to the idols. So guess what? The king of, of Assyria had legal rights to the bloodline of King Hezekiah because of heirs. Second King says, 16 says, and heirs took the silver and gold in the house of the Lord and in the treasure of the king's house and, and, and sent a present guest to the king of Assyria. So in his bloodline, even though in his heart, Hezekiah did not want to have anything to do with the, with the idols of his bloodline, the evil altars in his bloodline. But you cannot ignore them, though. So he thought, he thought by zeal, I was just going to do what my father couldn't do. I'm just going to apply in for the Lord. And, you know, he, made, he meant well, but it didn't last long. Because if you read 2 Kings 16, 10 to 15, you know, I'm not going to read it for you right now, but you, you, I, I want you to see it. When you go home, you can read the whole thing. But what the story is about King Ayers, King Ayers at one point when he was a king, before Hezekiah became king after him, he went to Damascus where the king of Syria was. And when he went there, he saw how the king of Syria had this altar to Baal. And King Ahaz, even though he was, a, he, he was Jewish and was supposed to be worshiping the God of Abraham, he fell in love with that altar and how the, the Assyrian king worshipped. And you know what he did? He brought back that altar and the, and the Baal and he came back to Jerusalem and he told his builders, build me an altar like the king of Syria. And so he legally gave legal rights to the king of Syria over Jerusalem and over the, his bloodline. And so here comes King Josiah trying to deal with the same spirit, and he couldn't do it. The reason he couldn't do it is because the reason he couldn't do it is because is because that evil altar that was in his bloodline by his father had not yet been judged. But later, thankfully, if you read the story, you're going to find out that King Hezekiah was able to deal with the idol, of, with the altars of his father's house. You know what? And then God gave him a massive breakthrough. And that's what's going to happen to many of us today. Where we find the same principle with, uh, with, with uh, Gideon, you know, Gideon. The same principle we find with Gideon. You know, that Gideon, you know, the Israel was great impoverished in the days of Gideon. You know, they had lost money. They were hiding in caves. 
And then God appears to Gideon. You know, again, I'm not going to read the whole scripture, but Judges 6, 23, 27, we find Gideon as an encounter with an angel of the Lord. And when he realizes it's God, he begins to scream because he realizes, oh my God, I've seen God face to face. I'm, am I going to die? And the angel of the Lord assures him, says, you're not going to die. You know, and then Gideon builds an altar to the Lord. Now, you would think that building an altar to the Lord was enough for God to move in the life of Gideon. But that's not enough. God says to Gideon, Gideon, he comes back, he says, Gideon, I want you to build me a second altar. But this time, the way you're going to build it, my second altar is like this. I want you to take down your father's altar of Baal that belongs to your father. That's what he tells him in verse 25. He says, I want you to go and take your father's bull that's seven years old and tear down the altar of Baal that belongs to your father. Why is God saying this? Because God understood that, that if Gideon tried to fulfill his destiny, just because, just because God was moving in his life and he had a personal altar with the Lord, if he tried to do his destiny without confronting and pulling down the altar of his father's house, that altar had legal rights to Gideon because it had been established by his own father who had authority over Gideon. So the devil had a lot of legal rights in the courts of heaven that he could have used to come into Gideon's life and stop his breakthroughs, stop his momentum, or, you know, or, make it, or, or minimize his impact in the kingdom. So God says, no, Gideon, it's not enough for you to have an altar with me. You need to destroy the altar that's in your bloodline. And that's what we're going to do in a few minutes. We are going to, I'm going to take you into the court of heaven and we are going to do that. You know, in Second Chronicles chapter 31, verse 5 to 7, we see Ezekiah, you know, he brings an offering, you know, to destroy the Assyrian king. And you, we find that if you read it, it's an amazing way of King Ezekiah, you know, realizes what's going on and comes to the Lord with an offering to the Lord. And as he comes with an offering to the Lord, you know, God begins to destroy the hold of the Assyrian king over the nation of Israel. And I'm telling you, we are going to do the same thing today because I believe God is going to uh, bring us into a place of tremendous breakthrough in the area of finances in Jesus' mighty name. You know, see, one of the ways you, you when you're prosecuting an evil altar and idols in your bloodline, one of the things that you have to do is bring a peace offering in the courts of heaven. This is extremely important and it's all based on scripture. In Psalm 96, uh, God says this, for great is the Lord and great to be praised. He is to be reverently feared and worshiped above so-called gods. For all the gods of the nations are lifeless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Notice this is about idols and idols. And remember, whenever they are idols, always assume evil altars are behind them. Because no idol ever exists without an altar. Always understand that. It's always there. So when God's talking about idols, he's dealing with idols and evil altars all in one place. So God is saying, you are worshiping all of these things, giving them everything. You, are, you know, they were honoring them with their offerings, with their lives. And so God says, how do you come back to me empty-handed? In other words, out, out there, you come back to me. You've been worshiping your idols with something. So he says, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. But look at verse 8. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him into his court. That's what King Ezekiah did to destroy the Assyrian king. If you really read the whole story, it's amazing what he had to do. He brought an offering to the courts of the Lord. Okay, you know, and God was able to bring great deliverance to Israel and destroy the Assyrian king. And then the Bible says, and the Lord blessed uh, uh, King Ezekiah like no, no, nobody's business. The point is, when you come into the court of heaven to prosecute an idol, particularly a man is stealing an altar or idol, you must come to the Lord with an offering that says, God, you know, what I've, what I've in the past given to my idols, the symbol of what I've given to my idols, the symbol, the symbol of my dedication to them, I'm giving to you because I want to restore the honor and the glory that's due to your name. I'm telling you, it becomes a powerful testimony against those idols, against those evil authors in the courts of heaven. And at the same time, it redeems your finances. And that's what we're going to, to do. You know, so there are two things we're going to do when we go in the court of heaven now in the next few, in the next few minutes. There are two key, we are going to come into time of repentance. And then 
I'm going to talk to you about giving to the Lord a sacrificial offering. Repentance and the sacrificial offering cleanses your bloodline. Look at Ezekiah. God tells Ezekiah, that says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Surely I'll add to you days, 15 years. I'll deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I'll defend this city. This is a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing which has spoken. Behold, I'll bring the shadow on the sandal which has gone down with the sun on the, on the sandal of airs, 10 degrees. In other words, God said, I've seen the offering you brought in the temple. I've seen your repentance to me. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to reverse time all the way back to Ahaz. Why Ahaz? That's where the Assyrian king was given legal authority to, a, to Ezekiah's bloodline to plunder it of finances, you know, to plunder it. And God said, I'm going to go back. It's going to be like your forefathers never over, ever opened the door to these idols and evil, to these idols and evil altars. It's going to be like it never even happened. That's powerful, my friend that we are going back all the way back, you know? So we see that prosecuting evil orders in your bloodline leads to massive financial breakthroughs. And Ezekiah had very great wealth and honor, and he made for himself treasuries of silver, God. I mean, God blessed this guy. He blessed his socks off. But if you look at the sequence, it's because of how he was able to deal with the Assyrian king, how he was able to prosecute the evil orders and idols that his father Ahaz had brought into the bloodline. This, my friend, is what we are going to do together as I lead you today in the court of heaven. So get ready for us to go into the court of heaven because I'm telling you, God is going to do it. You know, as a matter of fact, the, what I'm about to do, I have actually done it. You know, God gave me a similar experience. I don't have time to go into it, but the Lord took me back to Africa and he showed me the house where we used to live 30 years ago that I haven't been there, you know, for 29, 30 years. And God told me, go back. And he showed me, I wanted to go and prosecute. Something happened there. And God showed it to me, showed it to our family in a prophetic dream. And I'm telling you, I, my wife and I flew to Africa. And we went to, to a house I had, not been, I had not seen in 29 years. And we went to that house. And we, God told me, I did, and because your, the destruction of your family, the downfall of your family began here. God said, I want you to prosecute the idol, the evil altar that began to come against your family. And you have been fighting this altar since then. You know, and I'm telling you, ever since I did that, there has been a massive financial, ministerial breakthrough, marital breakthrough in my life. So I'm telling you, what's going to happen today is going to change your life. Peace is going to come to you like never before in Jesus' mighty name. So as we get ready to go into the court of heaven, I, I, I want you at the end of our prayer or at the end of the Bible study, find some time today to plant a seed. I normally do not do it this way, but I'm telling you today, the Lord said to me, you cannot bring them into the court of heaven to prosecute money, stealing evil orders if they don't bring into the court of heaven an offering of what the enemy has been stealing from them. They have to bring a representation, an offering of what the enemy has been stealing from them, what their ancestors worship the enemy with, the finances. God, you need to bring them into the court of heaven with me so that as they do that, they will be restoring the glory due my name, but at the same time, they'll be giving me the symbol of what the enemy has been using to oppress them, and I'm going to deliver them. Okay? So again, you know, there are ways to give, uh, in, there are ways for you to give your sacrificial seed. As you believe God to de prosecute those evil, money stealing evil orders in your bloodline. You know, there are ways to give by mail. You can write to FMI PO Box 2467 Scottsdale, Arizona. It's right there, 85252. Uh, online at francismouse.com. Pretty easy, francismouse.com. Or by Zelle, you can simply say info at francismouse.com or cash app, hashtag francismouse.com. Now that's, you know, you know, you're not giving me because I need money. You are giving because you need to bring an offering to the Lord as you prosecute the evil money stealing orders in your bloodline. So here's what I want you to do everywhere. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Whatever you are, I want you to pray a prayer after me because we are going to pray together in Jesus' mighty name. In an, and God is going to touch you in a fresh and new way. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah.
Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we're going to pray together. So whatever you are, we're going to pray together. And after the prayer of release, we are going to then, um, we are then going to, uh, I'm going to open up the call so that I can hear from the, some of the moderators and hear from some of you, read some of your comments, some of your, uh, your, your chat comments. I'll have to look at that. Amen. Praise God. But let's come before the court of heaven. Get ready because we are going to prosecute this evil money stealing altars. Amen. That have been in your bloodline in Jesus' mighty name. So I want you to pray this prayer after me. Whatever you are right now. And simply say, Heavenly Father, I come before the court of heaven as your blood-washed child, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I ask for the court of heaven to be seated in order to adjudicate my case against idols and evil orders in my bloodline that Satan has been using to remove my boundaries and rob me of my treasures. Rob me of my nest egg. Rob me of my financial inheritance you want to give me, Lord, to advance your kingdom. Heavenly Father, as I come before you, I come standing in the court of heaven with my advocate, my counselor, the Holy Spirit, and I'm asking that the Lord Jesus Christ be my defense to help me prosecute the evil money stealing altars in my bloodline and the idols behind them, the demon gods behind them that were authorized by my ancestors knowingly or unknowingly to devour my finances, to create life events in my life that I end up spending money on things I did not end, desire to spend money on. Heavenly Father, it is clear to me according to your word, that I cannot function effectively in your kingdom if I am poor and I have no money to afford what I need to do for your kingdom. Heavenly Father, as I'm before you, I I enter my plea of guilt, guilty. I say I'm guilty as charged, that me and my bloodline are guilty as charged. Lord, since I'm in your courtroom, I cannot lie. So I admit that there has been sinful activities in my life. There's been times in my life where I have worshipped idols by placing anything above you, Lord. I admit, Lord, that there has been iniquities in my bloodline and evil altars erected in my bloodline by my forefathers. So, Heavenly Father, I accept all of Satan's charges that are legitimate and real. But Lord, it is written that I'm redeemed by your blood, that through your blood I have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. So Father, since I've agreed with my adversary, he can no longer imprison me in any way. Now I'm asking for the blood of Jesus 
to cleanse me as I repent for every transgression of worshiping idols or any kind of idolatry that has existed in my soul or in my bloodline. I repent of all of it, Lord, as I place you first in my life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for counseling and destroying the system of authorization that my forefathers, in their ignorance of who you are, Lord, gave to the demonic powers. Heavenly Father, I'm asking that the same thing you did for Gideon, you do for me. That as I come in your courtroom to bring these idols and evil altars that have been stealing my finances, I'm asking God that you release a massive breakthrough in my life. Heavenly Father, Jesus said, how can you bind a strong man? How can you, how can you plunder the, the, the house of a strong man unless you first bind the strong man? Heavenly Father, as I'm in your courtroom, I realize that the strong man over the kingdom of idols and evil altars, according to Ezra chapter 10, is the Assyrian king. Heavenly Father, I summon the Assyrian king, to appear in your court, and every idol and evil altar he controls in my bloodline, I summon them right now to appear in your courtroom to face charges in Jesus' name. Father, I repent for anything I've had in common with, this, with the Assyrian king and every evil man is stealing altar that's under the Assyrian king. I'm asking you that you cleanse me from anything I have in my soul that's in common with the Assyrian king. There is nothing that he has that I want, Lord, because I want all of Jesus. Lord, I want all that you have to offer. So Father, I'm asking that you give me a bill of divorcement from the Assyrian king and his kingdom of idols. I shall worship the Lord my God with all my soul, with all my heart, and with all my strength. In Jesus' name. Father, as I've repented of everything that the devil was holding on to as legal rights, I'm asking God that you overthrow now the hold of the Assyrian king his kingdom of idols, and the evil altars. I say, Lord, cleanse my bloodline right now and send angels into my bloodline to uproot these evil altars, for they shall be no more in Jesus' name. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving me a verdict of release by your grace. I thank you that your grace sets me free from the power of the law. For no man can be justified by the keeping of the whole law. But I thank you that through the grace of Jesus, I fulfill the whole law through the death and the life of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you have given me a righteous verdict against the Assyrian king, his kingdom of idols, and the evil money-stealing altars that have been stealing money from me in the past. Heavenly Father, as I'm in your courtroom, I also ask, Lord, for punitive damages against the Assyrian king and his evil money-stealing altars. I'm asking God 
that all the money that I've lost over the years to the Assyrian king and the evil and the evil money stealing order of my bloodline must now be returned to me with interest in Jesus' name. Even if you have to plunder the entire house of the Assyrian king, you said when the thief is found, he shall be made to restore seven th- sevenfold. Lord, I'm standing on your word in Proverbs chapter 6 and 31 that the thief has been found. Now he must restore to me seven times of what he stole from me. I declare and declare, Father, that I'm entering now a season of unprecedented financial breakthrough in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I also ask you to issue a divine restraining order against the Assyrian king that will not trespass in my bloodline again. In Jesus' name. I receive this divine restraining order, Lord, by faith. Amen. Amen. Now listen, if you pray that prayer, I'm telling you, I'm telling you powerful things are going to happen in your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Powerful things are going to happen in your life. You know, right now, whatever you are, I want you to shout. I know we can't hear you on, because you are muted, but I'm telling you, I want you to give God a praise offering because I'm telling you, you just got delivered. You are going to see financial breakthrough like never before. This prayer of release is, a, I mean, I'm telling you, this prayer of release is powerful in Jesus' mighty name. So I'm telling you, I'm going to open up. I want to hear from you, but I'm telling you, this is the day of your release. Mark this on your calendar as the day God be God as the day you went to court and prosecuted evil money stealing our altars. That when you prosecute the Assyrian king and he had and, and just like Ezekiah, he has to let go of the money he's robbed you of, and it must come back to you sevenfold. Your children are gonna walk in prosperity. They you never even they never saw you never saw nobody like this because everything is returning to you. In Jesus' name. Businesses that were destroyed, watch God. This time, bless your business and it will shoot off like a rocket. Business deals uh, uh, that were stolen from you, I'm telling you, there's restoration right now. God is telling me, Francis, prophesy restoration financial restoration the wealth of the wicked is being released during the covid day 19 i'm telling you god has chosen the covid day 19 era to release financial wealth to the body that's why this revelation is coming is because he needed to to take care of this issue in your life so when he releases this money on your life this prospect on your life you are not going to lose it uh, from the, from the back end the devil will not blindside you and steal what belongs to you in Jesus' mighty name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so excited. Now listen, I'm just going to make one, a, a quick announcement. Uh, we have operating in the Coach of Heaven conference with my dear friend Robert Henderson, Rodney Osborne, some, uh, Lee Robertson, and my wife Camilla. We're going to be in Alabama, September 24, 26. You can find out more about this conference in, uh, on my website, Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And of course, you know, the, my wife has amazing artwork. I wanted to get in your, in your to get. Praise God. You pray, I mean, I, I, prayers and decorations, prayers, they are out there for you. My books are out there for you. It's amazing what's available for you on my website. And also, please subscribe to my YouTube channel because like this teaching, I'm going to edit it and we're going to upload it to YouTube so you can enjoy the teaching again. Send your friends and family to it. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Simply type in Francis Miles in the YouTube search. When my channel shows up, subscribe. Amen. Again, our next Bible study is going to be September 5, and we're going to be talking about the voices in the courts of heaven, and I'm hoping my friend Robert Anderson will be with us. Amen. Here we go. I'm going to stop the screen share. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I just want to... Um, I'm going to ask a, a couple of our... our uh, I'm going to ask a couple of our, um, our panelists to, to put your videos on. Put your videos on so I can see you. 
you know, now you have, you, you have the right to put your videos on. So I can see you. Praise God. So I'm just going to start with Linda Enright. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, unmute yourself, Linda. And unmute yourself. Just give us, yeah, just give a, a, a Pastor Linda, just give us a quick uh, commentary of what you have heard today. What's your take? Well, you know, I always get an amazing lot of teaching and learning from any of these you do, but I have to tell you, this was fabulous because I know somebody, thank God it's not me, that it got the problem of buying, buying, buying and filling up a house with stuff that they never wear or use. So I can relate to anyone married to someone like that or anyone that has someone in their family line like that. And how simple it is when you go through the Bible and show even something as simple as how did, how did it come to pass in our lives or their lives, especially the part about killing babies for money. That was incredible that it's in the Bible. I just get such, so much learning from everything you do. I can't even put it into words. You are, it's so wonderful to see how God tells you, this is what it really means in the Bible. We are so blessed to have you in our lives. And I praise God for you and thank you. It was just incredible. And the prayer of course is beyond. But I just wanna mention real quickly that I have used the courts of heaven many times and I had someone that owed me money for over 10 years, a lot of money. And we sat down and said that went into the courts of heaven and I got every penny. Praise the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. After, after so, 10 years. Wow. Wow. So you see, so Pastor Linda, you are testifying to the people that what we did today is, is not, is no joke. It's real. It is so real. I wish I could tell everybody and see their faces. This is so real. You have to believe it. It is so real. And I, I have so many testimonies of things from the courts of heaven, but I don't remember praising, say praising God, hallelujah, hallelujah, before I did it. I, I of course said prayers and repentance, of course, but also to, of course, I'm a big giver, but to give for that reason, really good. Yeah. Really, wow, really. fantastic. I am so, Thank you know what, I can't wait to listen to it again, tell you the truth. Yeah, amen. Make, make, a, make a commentary on what you have heard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miles, and thank you, everyone. This, um, again, has just been uh, an input into our lives that is timely. I know you always speak of the um, spirit and the concept of divine interception, and I believe that today's teaching is actually an act of interception, because if we are poised for wealth transfer, our souls have to be ready to, you know. Oh, it's over. Free. And who's the first person he has talked? Hold on, I'll mute you. So go ahead. Yeah. Yes, our souls have to be ready to possess that great wealth, and that is the point of the, of, of today's teaching. That is the is the biggest takeaway for me, because I've been going through this process of you know appreciating the need for the healing of the wounds in the soul. And so even today, I, I, I agree with um, everyone here that as the word says, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers as a first priority that the soul has to prosper so that we indeed will possess our possessions having prosecuted these evil money stealing wow. idols and altars. Mm. That's I continue to bless you, Dr. Miles, and the, the, the Francis Miles International Ministries, and everyone um, here today. Oh, hi. I'm very okay. privileged to say something. Go ahead. I, I am amazed, Dr. Miles, at your, at your teachings. They just highlight such core aspects of um, matters that need to be dealt with. And you, you explain it so clearly. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And the other thing that I like about your, your teachings is that they work. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's true. They do. It, it does. It works. And it, it makes sense. And it, you just, I, I enjoy these uh, Bible studies because every time I listen to you and re-listen on, on YouTube. I learn something new and you're opening the Bible, you're opening the kingdom. And it is, 
it's wonderful and i have searched and prayed for years for this stuff and no one has done um put things together like you have you were truly anointed for for your the ministry that you have and it's i'm very thankful for it and i'm thankful that you're also expanding into uh television and you, yes. that your ministry is growing because more people will be able to hear and to learn yes and to experience uh what god has for us so thank you that's phenomenal